All right. So in this lesson, I'm going to go over passive design. Um, passive design is a really important set of principles. Um, it's a really important concept in green building and building uh, building systems. Um, we've talked about these a number of times, and we will continue to talk about these throughout the semester. So I wanted to provide a, a full summary of passive design principles. So we'll go over what passive design is um, and what passive solar design is. We'll look at the five passive solar design principles and how they can be deployed in a building, give you some examples of each. Um, also want to stress how that these five principles have to work together to have a truly passive building. Um, we'll also discuss natural ventilation and free cooling uh, and go briefly over some of the history of passive design. As you'll see, it's not a new concept. So passive design is can be thought of as use, utilizing surrounding conditions to reduce energy use in a building in general. So we can use it for any number of things. So a lot of times it's used for heating. So we use the sun um, to provide heat to the building. Um, but you can use it to do natural ventilation. Um, and you can provide some lighting, uh, cooling, uh, some dehumidification um, as well. The key is that we're you know, we want to get out of that mentality of we have this building and we can just put it wherever we want, orient it however we want, design it however we want, put whatever architecture we want, regardless of the local climate um, and other cons like local considerations. So we've kind of spent a lot of, you know, a lot of our, you know, last hundred years or so um, really is sort of walling ourselves off from the environment and then we have all these really cool technologies that we can actively heat and cool a building we have you know hvac equipment we have furnaces and boilers and heat pumps now and everything and so we can really easily get into this mentality that like look we can just put it wherever we want and heat it and cool it provide the lighting and don't worry about it but there's an increasing recognition that we need to reduce our energy use reduce especially in terms of the impact that um you know we're where we get our energy from um, has on the environment. So the use of fossil fuels in particular um, with climate change and many other sources of pollution um, is a really important consideration. And so the idea here is when we design a house and we have to do this from the outset, it's really hard to retrofit passive design. But if you do it at the beginning, um, you can really plan it out so you take advantage of the local conditions. All right, so that's passive design. And, and the passive part is really important here. This is not active, right? So this is not using solar panels and wind turbines and high efficiency cooling and things like that. Although that can be integrated, the passive part means you're not actively really doing anything. You're just allowing the natural conditions to provide heating, and cooling, and other energy reduction. Now, passive solar design is a major component of this. And this is one that people tend to focus on a little more. And this is from your book, um, and they define it as using a building's components to collect, store, and distribute the sun's energy to reduce the demand for heating. So this is really all about heating reduction, although I would add that lighting energy use reduction is part of this as well. So we'll go over these five pa uh, passive solar design principles one by one. We have orientation, glazing, shadings and overhang, um, insulation and air sealing, and thermal mass. Really, really important. Put this down in your notes. All of these must be used at the same time in order to have a truly passive design. You can't, I mean, you can pick and choose and it's going to help. So each of these individually do contribute to uh, a, a reduction in energy use. But if you really want to maximize your design, you have to integrate all these principles together. So let's go over these one by one. The first one is orientation. Orientation is just the compass direction that your building is facing. Um, and the general rule, so in the northern hemisphere, okay, so in the northern hemisphere, we want our buildings to be faced mostly south. And um, feel free to press pause and think about why that is. But again, with passive solar design, we're really trying to capture sunlight. And so if you look at this chart here, it does a pretty good job of illustrating this. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can see in the northern hemisphere, the sun, this is the sun path throughout the course of the day. So this is in the winter. It's not drawing anymore for some reason. Okay, sorry about that. So this is the sun path. Let me get my laser pointer. That might help actually. There you go. 
So this is the sun in the west. And all throughout the year, and then it gets closer here to the south, in the middle of the day in the west. In the middle of the summer, it rises a little bit northeast, but then it spends most of the day. The sun in the northern hemisphere is to the south of, of you almost all the time, when it, whenever it's up, of course. Um, and so in order to maximize the solar heat gain, right, so we're doing passive, we want to capture that sunlight, we need to have south-facing um, buildings and and you want to have the long the east west should be the long part of your building in order to maximize so you think you know the, that way you can capture the most south southern sunlight okay um, and you can um, we'll talk about using trees and shading is okay so you need to combine this with um, windows or glazing okay and so it's not really all that helpful to have the sun coming in and hitting the south part of your building if you don't have windows that will allow that sun through and then you can use it inside um, the building, right? So if it's hitting the wall, it's warming up the wall and it might s slowly heat up the house, but you really want to have these windows, uh, enough windows to allow that sunlight in when you want it inside so it can come in and heat up the building. Okay. However, you got to be careful here. You can't. You don't want to overdo it. You don't want to have a building that's full of windows, because windows have really poor R values. Okay, and so you can't have a really efficient building with a whole bunch of windows. I mean, you can get up to I think like R8, R10 is the maximum you can do for. And these are like incredibly expensive windows. Um, so you don't want to overdo it. Um, also, I mean, there's there's not a lot of use of having a whole lot of windows on the east and west side. I mean, this is a sunroom that's different, but on the main part of your house, you're trying to heat. Um, by having those windows on the east and the west and the north side, you rarely get direct sunlight. So you want to minimize the window uh, area east-west, and particularly on the north side. Okay. Um, now you want to combine this with overhangs and shading, and here's why. Um, you allow the sunlight in the winter that's good right because you want the sunlight to come in and heat up the building in the winter because you can still get you know sun in the winter um, and as long as you have good insulation and everything else you can you can use however in the summer if you think about it you have a hot part of a summer day you don't want that sunlight to come in the building and so what you can do again this is a passive design component is you can have an overhang like this. You see in this, and we'll, we'll, I'll show you some images of some others here. But if you design this properly and have it the right length and orientation, so let's say this is faced south. So in the winter, the sun is lower in the sky. So this in the hot part, the sun is higher in the sky in the summer than it is in the winter, and you should know that. Um, so the sun, let's say it's up here. So now you have the sun coming in and it hits this overhang which will, as you can see, shade this window, which means in the really hot part of the day, that sun won't be coming in that window. And that way you're not over, you know, you're overheating, you could overheat the house in the summer if this overhang wasn't there, window in the south. Um, and that could uh, cause you to use more energy, not less, okay? So you can have overhangs to do that. And again, there's any number of ways you can do it. Another way you can do that is um, you can use natural, um, vegetation to let me see if I can draw here. So if you have like a tree, a deciduous tree, right? Nice big deciduous tree facing. Okay, so in the summer, sunlight comes in, hits the leaves of the tree, and it does a nice job of shading everything here. Okay, then in the winter, when the leaves fall, right? So the leaves fall, winter sun can a lot more of it can make it through because the tree drops its leaf. You can use other things like vines and so forth. Um, so anyway, again, this is supposed to be passive. So this is not like, you know, uh, having an awning that mechanically goes out and comes back. Although, I mean, you could apply that. That's not technically passive, really. Um, but any natural way, any way that you can just sort of like design it and build it, leave it there, and then block the summer sun, but allow that winter sun in. That's a really important part of passive design. This should go go without saying, insulation, insulation and air sealing. Um, you let all this nice heat in the winter, 
it's not going to stay in there if you don't have really well insulated like something like this um, and really nice nicely air sealed not like this this is an example of bad insulation this is an example of an air leak coming in from a basement with an infrared camera so you need to have a nice tight building tight, tight air seal um, and also insulation throughout so thermal mass this is one that is um, not as well used not as well understood um, but it's absolutely essential for passive design so the thermal mass a thermal mass is just a generic term for something that heats up. It takes a long time to heat. So it's really good at absorbing heat. It takes a while to heat up. Think about, um, you know, if you've ever, um, if, you know, you or somebody had an outdoor pool, um, you know, when you were growing up and, or, or now, I guess, and you know that it's a really big body, you know, a really big pool of water and it takes a while to heat up so it can be you know may and june it can be really hot for days at a time and that water is still relatively cool because it takes a, it absorbs a lot of heat it takes a long time to heat up but that's because it has a good thermal mass then what's the the sort of flip side of that is over the summer it slowly absorbs more and more of that heat and then it stays warmer later in the year because it slowly releases that heat as well so that's what a thermal mass does it takes a long time and um, there's a lot of different materials. They're mostly natural materials, but concrete's a good thermal mass. So um, here's an example in this image. Uh, this is this floor in this image is um, a thermal mass. Okay. And so let's assume that this is south facing window. You have the sunlight coming in and the winter hits the floor. And so what happens is it takes a while for this floor to heat up. So it, it's warm, but it doesn't get real hot during the day. Then at night when the sun goes down, and this is the key, this is the key. At night when the sun goes down, it's going to slowly release that heat back out to the building because it takes a long time to cool down. Okay. And so it, what it does is it tempers the, the um, temperature. Um, it absorbs a bunch of heat during the day. And then at night, when the sun goes down, it slowly releases that heat out into the building and keeps it warmer. And the flip side is in the summer, um, if this, any sunlight hits this floor, again, it's not going to get hot really fast. It's going to take a long time to heat up. And so you don't end up with this really hot floor, which makes the house hotter during the day. It actually keeps keeps it kind of cool relative to something that would heat up quickly, like a, um, like a linoleum or... Uh, something like that or like an engineered floor or wood floor okay so they get hot pretty quickly and then they cool down at night um, but these will actually get uh, heat up slowly um, throughout the course of the day and again this must be combined with orientation windows and overhang right so you you need to um, integrate this with the south facing um, windows and walls some examples of the thermal mass some really good thermal masses Anything that's really heavy and dense, particularly if you have kind of a rough texture to it, which gives it more surface area to absorb the sun. Um, so exposed concrete, stone, brick, rammed earth, those are, you know, the brick, stone, and exposed concrete are pretty common. Ceramic tile, stone tile. If you can use water, you can use rammed earth, clay cob. So a lot of these natural materials. Um, some that are not good are things like wood, vinyl, engineered flooring, carpet, certainly metal. Those all heat up. There's, these at the bottom all heat up pretty quickly and then cool down quickly. These take a while to heat up. A, a really good example of this is a hearth. Okay, so if you've ever heard of a hearth around a a, um, a fireplace, so hearth. Okay, so this has been used for thousands of years, and and if you notice, this is all stone. Okay, so this is a stone hearth. And you have your fireplace here, and so what happens is you have your fire here during the during the day when people are around tending to the fire. That fire is going to heat up, warm the house. Okay, and what's going to happen is it's going to slowly heat up these the stone around it too. So all this is going to get nice and warm, right? And then at night when you turn the fire down, because you know you can't, there's nobody there to tend to it. This is going to slowly release that heat into the room overnight okay so all of this that heat out and that's a good way again it's just like the earthen floor um, you can 
capture your own heat during the day and then release it at night. So that's a really, um, I mean, that's been known, again, for thousands of years, um, and these are still used today. So when you do, oops, excuse me, when you do passive design, you really want to think about the what you're doing in the room. So again, pa a, a good passive design, you need to think about this ahead of time when you're designing the building. And so if you have rooms that are going to be used more often, that people are going to be in, and the heating and the free lighting is going to be helpful. So you want to think about putting those on the, again, this is in the Northern Hemisphere, sort of south, south southwest to southeast, okay? Because they'll get the most direct sunlight. And so, you know, some of these rooms back here, if they're not used as often, then you're not too as worried about it. Um, and you can, you can sort of uh, maximize the living space passive design. As I said, there's an, any number of ways you can use overhangs. This is a really good example. You may have seen something like this um, out there, that these um, nice little um, overhangs that over each window, this looks like it's a modern commercial building, and you can actually see the shadow here that's sh shading the window. And so these are designed so that in the winter, the low angle sun will come in, go through the windows and passively heat the rooms. But in the summer, you get that intense sunlight, it'll hit these and it'll shade the windows. These are both images from your book, by the way. So anyway, there's any number of ways you can use overhangs. You can get really cool, you know, this or just, you know, plain old uh, an eave that sort of juts over, um, you know, hangs over the rest of the building. Um, these are as you saw in the reading, not new ideas, okay? So literally thousands of years, humans have known how to take advantage of passive solar design principles. Um, Greeks and Romans used to orient their buildings to the south. Um, the Greeks would put whole city streets going east to west um, so they could capture that, the sunlight from the south. So this is, you know, they're both Mediterranean climates, so they get pretty hot during the day and cool down at night. Um, and they would t they take advantage of the winter sun um, to, to passively heat the building. Um, this is a picture of Mesa Verde, um, which is a Native American cliff dwelling. So this is actually carved into the cliff. So this is made of, this is made of stone, which is a good thermal mass. Um, but you can see here this uh, really huge overhang. So this is a south-facing cliff wall. Um, and you can see it's shading the buildings uh, underneath. Okay, so they this is from, I forget the... I don't know, 1,500 years ago, something like that. This is in the United States. Um, if you look at um, a lot of desert architecture, they use a lot of adobe, um, mud brick, and that sort of thing. And anything like that is a really good thermal mass. So you'll see these really thick walls. Um, that again, if you're in a hot desert, it takes it's a thermal mass, so it takes a long time to heat up. So if you have like a two foot thick wall, um, you basically can keep the inside of the building cool, even on a hot summer day in the desert. And then at night, it usually cools down in the desert, and so it'll release that heat as well. So um, this is not a new concept. Um, it's only we've sort of started to relearn and reuse some of these concepts in in a more uh, modern context. So natural ventilation. This is not passive solar design. This is passive design. So natural ventilation um, utilizes the prevailing breeze to remove heat from the house. So you want to, again, you need to plan this out before you design the house, and you, you want to take note of the local conditions, and you, you figure out which way the breeze normally comes from. Uh, and and from, your, from one of the videos in the book, you know, it said a lot, I think this is in California, but it said a lot of your summer breezes come from the south. I know where I am on the east coast, I get a lot of, um, westerly winds, so they blow from west to east. Um, but anyway, you need to take note of local conditions, and the local topography can change that, you know, based on where you are. Anyway, you want to take advantage of that, and the key here is that you, you want to have windows that you can open. Uh, and so in this image, this is from a, a video that was posted, you have the breeze that blows through, okay, coming in this way, and then you want to open windows on the other side of the building as well to allow that to go all the way through and what it does is it basically pulls the heat away from the building. Um, this is particularly good at night if it cools down at night but it's also can be useful during the day. You can have a hot day um, with a cool breeze um, and take advantage of that. Okay so that's natural ventilation. One thing I noticed I, I was in Denmark um, some years ago 
And I notice a lot of houses have um, windows on the roof like this. Some of them will have windows all the way across the top. And it, as it turned out, so Denmark has almost no air conditioning in the whole country. It's really hard to find an air conditioner in even in modern buildings. This obviously is an older building, um, but they've been designing this way for, for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And what they do is you can take advantage if you have um, some windows and doors, you know, at the ground level. And then what you can do when it gets hot out, you can actually open these upper story windows. Okay, you open them up and what that does is a, it takes advantage of any breezes. It is a really windy country, so the breeze will come through. But it also, because the these windows are high in the building, the convective heat is rising up, and you can actually create almost almost a stack effect. Um, actually, you do create a stack effect where the heat rises, goes out the top, and then it, what it does is it actually pulls more air in the lower part of the building. So they knew about the stack effect and natural cooling, again, hundreds not thousands of years ago. Incidentally, I just think it's cool that a lot of these roof you see this roof is actually a natural material. So speaking of green building, um, and this is a close up of it. It's it's straw. So it's this local straw that, that grows in these like bogs nearby. And they literally just cut it down, they dry it out, and and um, this is not not an exaggeration, I'm not kidding. They actually it, like two people take basically what's a giant sewing needle. They put these things in bunches, lay them across the rafters, and one person like puts the it's like a needle on a string, a really big one, goes up through the roof. The other person grabs it and goes around and ties it down, and they just basically sew the roof to the wood framing, uh, and that's all it is. I mean, this is ju there's no there's no additions. It's naturally waterproof. It's naturally um, a natural insulator. Uh, and, and there's a lot of buildings with this natural roofing material in Denmark. I thought it was fascinating. Even even modern buildings or people you know actively live in these houses, um, and they stay dry. Okay, so uh, this YouTube video is uh, posted, but I wanted to go over it again, um, and it shows an example of a bunch of the passive design principles in a modern home. We're designing the Honda Smart Home to achieve net zero energy goals, which means that on an annual basis we'll be producing as much or more renewable energy as we consume from the grid. But it's not enough to just put a bunch of solar panels on the roof. We really want the house itself to be very energy efficient. So we started with a concept called passive design. This is an old idea, but we're really trying to optimize it by applying some very modern design tools. So you notice that he said, um it's a net zero design building. So this is actually passive principles, but they also have active um, heating and cooling in here and they have solar panels. So remember net zero energy building produces just as much renewable energy as it uses over the course of the year. But they integrate a lot of passive um, principles here as well. Passive design basically just means building your house to work with nature as much as possible. And this lets you really reduce the amount of energy that's needed for heating and cooling. So we're looking at how do you work with the local climate conditions? How do you position the house on the site for maximum efficiency? And then how do you build the outer layers, the shell that we call the envelope? Davis happens to be a really great place to apply these passive design techniques. We are in the valley, um, Central Valley, where our summers are quite warm but most evenings in the summer cool down quite a bit. We can use that cool air at night to basically bring into the house and avoid the use of air conditioning the next day. This is the south side of the building here. And as you can see, there's overhangs up above here and on the first floor, which shade the high summer sun so it keep the sun out from inside the house during the summer. But when the sun's angle in the winter time, it allows that sun in to provide free heat. The envelope is the outside of the building that basically separates the indoors from outdoors. So that's your walls, your windows, your roof, your floor. So the elements of the house um, include a, a double stud wall, uh, triple pane windows. The roofing material is a cool roofing material which reduces the amount of heat gain. So you notice he said um, it's a double frame which just means it's double thick, which means you can add more insulation than a typical timber frame, or excuse me, a stick uh, built house. Um, so you notice he's 
so far he's had the overhangs and shading. He's had he's now he's going over the insulation and air sealing um, aspects of passive design and and orientation as well. The slab is fully insulated because we are heating the house and cooling the house through the floor and we want all that heating and cooling to actually get into the space and minimize the loss to the ground. Uh, so what we're doing today is we're sealing the Honda Smart Home here at Davis. And what we're using is a new technology that we're developing for sealing envelopes um, using an aerosol spray and it is able to automatically seal buildings without a lot of the manual processes that go on in typical sealing. So we're using a blower door just to simply pressurize the building while we apply the spray. So the aerosol fog on the inside is kind of driven to the leaks uh, by the airflow because uh, when you pressurize the building, the only place for the air to escape is through leaks in the shell. So this is a really California. advanced um, technique that's not typically used, but I wanted to just take note of that. So normally with a blower door, what you do is you actually suck the air out of the building and depressurize it so you can pull all the air in and see where all the little leaks are. Um, but in this case, what they did is they turned it around, have the blower door it pushing in, and so they are pressurizing the house, and then they dump this um, chemical in there that will then be forced into these little cracks and crevices that you would normally have trouble finding, and then that automatically will seal all of those little cracks. So that's a really advanced uh, air sealing technique. The goal is to build zero net energy homes by the year 2020. So this house is a really good example on strategies that we can use to meet California's zero net energy goals. By using these passive design techniques, we're able to really reduce the amount of energy required for heating and cooling the home. This lets us use much smaller mechanical equipment that's also very efficient. So as a whole, we should be using about 75% less energy than a typical home. Smart passive design really is the first step to achieving so, your net zero um, energy. So, really goal. good modern example. As you can see, this took a lot of careful planning um, and design uh, and some advanced techniques. But um, you can see a lot of those passive design principles. We had the overhangs, we had shading, we had um, orientation, we have windows, we have insulation, we have air sealing. Now they didn't mention thermal mass, but I'm assuming that that floor is probably um, a good thermal mass. Um, and also they had the natural ventilation. They, they said at night you can open the windows and let the air cool um, the building. Okay, so let's look at another more rustic, uh, less, um, it's, it's advanced in its design and um, construction, but it's not as modern. It's a little more rustic. So let's take a look. Okay. So I want to give you a heads up on this one. This one's really interesting. Again, this video was posted, but this is a hybrid house <clears throat> that's half cob. The cob is mostly clay, um, straw, soil, some sand, uh, and then half straw bale. So actually, your book has mentioned straw bale a couple of times, and um, there's the north side of the building is made out of straw bale. The south, the south is out of cob. So you'll see again all of. Keep an eye out for thermal mass for shadings and overhangs, for orientation, for the use of windows, uh, and for insulation. Um, okay, so let's take a look. This is Cobb. Cobb gives you excellent thermal mass heat storage. So it's a critical part of a successful passive solar design, a building that's gonna heat itself and cool itself as much as possible its thermal mass as well as insulation. Here on the north side of the building, for better insulation, we use straw bale. Thermal mass, like Earth, is a completely critical part of an effective passive solar design. This is designed as a passive solar structure, so the thermal mass of the cob is on the south side of the building where the sun hits. You can't so, pull the good passive solar So, just to be clear, make sure you understand them. Two this front part of the house here is made of cob, and that's the south-facing wall, south, south side. And so that's where the sun will primarily hit, and so that's a good thermal mass. Cob is a good thermal mass. And you can see that it looks a little different here on the north side. Um, that's straw bale. So straw bale is not a good thermal mass, but it is a good insulator. But the sun doesn't directly hit the north side, as we discussed, so it's better to have more insulation. You actually can see they have a green roof here, which provides natural insulation, natural water catchment, um, also some habitat um, as well.
Lots of solar house out of two by fours and sheet rock and styrofoam insulation because you don't have the mass. So this is actually a hybrid structure. The back, the part to the left of this wall is straw bale and the part to the right is cob. Straw bale and cob hybrid buildings are very common. So what what you, you tend can to see straw is straw bale, bale walls on the north side. side of the building where you most want your insulation and cob on the south side of the building the part that gets hit by the winter sun so the cob can absorb the heat from the winter sun and re-radiate that into your building later to, to help warm it. That also makes sense because you tend to have most of your glazing, most of your windows on the south side and if you want a whole lot of windows on one wall, straw bale ends up being a difficult choice to do that with. Straw bale on the north, and you see these big, pretty flat walls without many windows. That's straw bale. And so that's one very simple and obvious hybrid system, is something like straw bale on the north for insulation, cob on the south for sculpture and thermal mass. And this interior wall here, this is cob up this high, and the cob is here for thermal mass. It absorbs heat from the wood stove when the wood stove is going. It also absorbs sun, sunlight directly in the winter coming through these windows. The midday sun shines on this cob and heats it up. The earth provides a lot of thermal mass, which heats up very slowly and cools down very slowly. So it's a really, really effective way to cool a house, in a, particularly in a dry climate like this. So historically, if you look at hot desert architecture anywhere in the world, what you see is really thick masonry walls made out of earth, usually, or stone. Those walls hold the coolness from the nighttime and very, very slowly heat up during the day. The way we do it here, at night we open up all the windows and we let the cool night air come through the house and that discharges any heat that's been stored up in the so You can actually see the overhang day. here. Is and then longer. in the morning we close right, up so all the windows. It juts out further, so here are these overhangs. You can see our shading the windows, but this is the extra overhang to shade this big glass door. And again, this is on the south side of the building. keep that coolness locked inside the building. In the winter, it works pretty much the same way, except of course, you don't open the windows at night, you leave them closed. And the sun, the low angle winter sun shining in through the south facing glass, that heat is absorbed into the thermal mass. Really good place for that thermal mass is in the floor. So we do these earthen floors in most of our structures. This is just made out of a clay soil, sand, and straw and sometimes gravel, and it's about four or five inches thick. And so the winter sun coming through hits on the earthen floor. The floor heats up during the day, as do any thermal mass walls that are close to the south side of the building and are also hit by the winter sun. All that heat is trapped inside the building. And then at night, when the sun goes down, the air temperature drops. Okay, so that's a really good explanation of, of, as, as I said, a more Again, no less advanced, um, but more rustic, less modern. Uh, this is kind of a timeless design. You can, one of the cool things about Cobb, incidentally, if you can see the sculpture, that's built into the wall um, because you can actually use Cobb as like mostly clay, so you can do um, sculpture and you know just make these shapes. You can make it pretty much any shape that you want. Okay, so those are the two examples of... Um, all of the passive design principles that um, we've discussed here. So we had overhangs and shading and insulation. Uh, he didn't mention anything about air sealing, but um, he did windows and orientation and also that natural ventilation. So all of that was integrated into this building um, and the previous building, building as you'll see. Okay, so again, passive solar design um, captures solar energy to provide heat and minimize active energy use. All five of these principles must be deployed at the same time in the same building. They must be planned um, carefully ahead of time in order to maximize your passive design.
So you have to have orientation, shading, and overhang, windows, insulation, air sealing, and thermal mass. Passive design is not a new concept. So remember, passive design is taking advantage of the local natural conditions, working with nature instead of against it. Um, and then, again, natural ventilation uses prevailing breezes to cool the building. So hopefully at this point you have a really good sense of all these different passive design principles, in particular passive solar, but also natural ventilation. And you should have now be able to identify a number of examples of these um, in buildings, you know, that you see around you. Actually, you, you'll see these principles now that hopefully you um, uh, we've gone over them. Okay, and that's it for this uh, discussion.